private encumbrances. An encumbrance is a claim on property that affects its value. You'll see here that I originally put that lowers its value, but as, you, but as we're going to go through this, we'll see that there are some encumbrances that actually enhance a property's value. Uh, some encumbrances do have that positive impact in, in making it more valuable. Now, there are two types of encumbrances, uh, public encumbrance, and those are created by public entities, and they promote the public welfare. And then there are private encumbrances, and those are created voluntarily, and that's the type of uh, encumbrance that we're going to be talking about. First type of private encumbrance is called a lien. Now, a lien is a claim on property to secure a debt, and we have different kinds of liens. In fact, liens are found not only as to real property, such as what we'll be talking about, but also as to uh, private property. But, but in this uh, video, we're just going to be talking about liens on uh, real property. First one is the mortgage or a deed of trust, and these are liens that are put on place, claim put on the property, uh, usually to secure the payment of the purchase price of that property. Uh, the uh, mechanic or materialman's lien is put on a property to secure payment of improvements. When someone improves uh, the property to uh, uh, a new roof, an addition, swimming pool, or even for those people that supply materials for that improvement, those folks have a lien that they can put on the property. And we typically uh, call these a uh, M&M lien or mechanic and materialman's lien. The next type of lien is a judgment lien. And a judgment lien is put on property uh, by a judgment creditor who has won a lawsuit against uh, someone who has, has been found to owe the judgment creditor some money. And so by uh, filing a lien in the uh, deed records, uh, a, a lien is, uh, uh, a judgment lien is, is put on all real property that is owned by that judgment debtor. And by the way, any of these liens can be foreclosed. If the debt's not paid, that means the property can be sold and the proceeds from the sale be given to the creditor to pay the debt. Next type of voluntary uh, encumbrance or private encumbrance is what we call restrictive covenants, also known as deed restrictions. Deed restrictions are created by a landowner to uh, enhance the value of the property as that property is resold to others. Uh, these usually are put in place when the landowner is developing the property and subdividing the property and so that it will be sold off to a, a number of different um, uh, uh, buyers and all of those buyers then have to live under these deed restrictions that, that uh, for example, uh, uh, govern the size of the house, the structure that's going to be put there, or whether or not uh, you, you can have a fence around your property, or whether you have to have a fence around your property, or perhaps it uh, prohibits certain types of activities. All these are just uh, examples of the types of things that could be in a restrictive covenant. Uh, and these restrictive covenants, or deed restrictions, serve the same function as zoning does when we were, as we talk about public encumbrances, but these restrictive covenants are private encumbrances. Now, these are enforced, they're, they're uh, enforced by a suit for injunction, and that suit, lawsuit can be brought by anybody who owns property under those deed restrictions. Let's talk about easements. Easements are the next type of private encumbrances that you will find. Now, an easement is a right to use property of another, real property of another, for a particular purpose. And we have two types of easements that we're going to be looking at. 
uh, pertinent easements and easements in gross. Now the first one here is a pertinent easement. Now, I've drawn a little picture here. Let's imagine you've got uh, a track of land and you've got a road going up the side of one, uh, one side of that land. And you've got two, uh, you've got one landowner, let's say it's A owns this entire property, but then A goes ahead and sells to B. And, but B says, I don't have a way to get to the road back over here. So A says, well, I'll give you an easement across my property. And so this easement would be uh, probably included in the deed that A makes to, to B. And then whenever B sells to C and C sells to D, that easement goes along with the lot as, as uh, the landowner of this tract of land sells to subsequent owners. And that's why we call it an appurtenant easement. It is created for the purpose of, of uh, benefiting a particular tract of land. The, the other type of easement is called an easement in gross. And an easement in gross does not benefit a particular tract of land, but rather a, uh, a person or, or a company, like a utility company. Uh, an example would be uh, a subdivision here. I've drawn another little diagram here. And we've got a bunch of lots, uh, lots 1 through 12 in this subdivision. And on the back side of these lots, you know, it'd be a street up here, a street down here, and these lots back up to each other. And going down the back side of these lots is a uh, utility easement for the purpose of power lines, uh, cable, tele uh, telephone, uh, gas, water, maybe, uh, any kind of utilities. This easement has been set aside. And so in this case, this easement would be for the benefit of the power company. Uh, no one particular uh, track, but, but for the benefit of the, the utility company to carry its power across all of those tracks. The last thing we want to look at is creation of an easement. How do we create easements and then Finally, termination of an easement. Easements are created by express grant, just like you would expressly uh, convey property, transfer property to someone. Well, you can expressly create an easement across property. Uh, and it's done by deed of, e of easement or an easement deed, for example, is what the document may be called. Uh, easements are also uh, created uh, in an implied manner rather than expressly, uh, but rather it's created by the way people uh, act and the actions that they take. Uh, this would include uh, uh, an easement that would be needed uh, to be able to, to enjoy someone, uh, a, a track of land. Example, let's go back to this AB track here. I've, I've drawn this again. And uh, let's say that uh, a and B, A owns that property again, but, uh, and he sells to the backside to B, but no mention is made of the driveway. But it's just understood that, uh, that B is going to need the, um, uh, the access. And so through their actions, uh, it's just implied that A is giving B uh, an easement in that driveway across A's land. Next, uh, an easement is created, what we call a prescriptive easement that's going to be very similar to adverse possession that uh, when, when you're talking about ownership or possession and claim on an entire tract of land as your own, well here we're simply talking about the use of the land and for a particular use by a particular person. So we call that a prescriptive easement. We don't use the word or the term adverse possession, but the elements are essentially the same. You uh, use that land that belongs to someone else for your particular purpose, for a uh, particular length of time. At some point, uh, whoever owns the surface of the land, they lose the right to take legal action against you. They've missed the statute of lim limitations. And so in essence, you have a prescriptive easement. Uh, next, we have a uh, uh, easement by necessity. There, a landlocked 
owner, and we can go down here to B again, uh, this, this example, in some instances B would actually have a right to uh, initiate a lawsuit to, to uh, condemn that land uh, of A's, part of that land, for a driveway. So we would call that by necessity. He's saying, I need this for necessity purposes, and he actually files a lawsuit. You know, A could have granted him uh, the, the easement, but he didn't. Uh, it might have been implied by A's actions. It wasn't. And so in some cases, B can actually file a lawsuit against A and say, I need that land for the use of a driveway. And then we, we look at uh, termination of an easement. Well, at the easement agreement, uh, has an express term. It says this easement is good for 20 years. Well, at the end of 20 years, it's going to expire. So expiration of the express term. Abandonment, if someone has an easement, but they stop using it, and they, there are signs that they have abandoned it and with no intention of using it again, such as this driveway, let's say, B goes ahead and, and, and blocks off this driveway, and the driveway grows over. And let's say A or B, let's even say B, puts up a fence across it and so and, and maybe take out the gate or if it's in a rural area, maybe a cattle guard, pull out the cattle guard, replace it with a fence. Uh, B's got another way to get into the property. B's abandoned it and you can say, well, B no longer has that easement. Merger. Uh, merger happens when you've got A and B with different tracts of land. Uh, the driveway benefits B, but A, a buys out B. And if A buys out B, well then both of these estates have merged now and there's no need for the easement. So it's terminated by merger. Uh, easement can also be terminated by foreclosure. Uh, let's say there's a lien on, on this property that B's got and after that they put in the driveway easement. If uh, B's mortgage is foreclosed on, then B's going to lose his driveway because it came after the, uh, the establishment of that prior mortgage. And then finally, uh, B, who's benefiting from this driveway, can actually release it back to A, can release it or terminate it uh, in, in, in writing, and uh, therefore it is no longer an easement. And that's an explanation of private encumbrances.